My name is Francisco Marmolejo. I'm here to talk about strategic liquidity provision in Uniswap v3. This is joint work with Zhou Fan, uh, who should be here, um, and, uh, and colleagues from, from Harvard University, Dan Rose, Mike Neuter, uh, Ritu Garao, and David Parks. Um, so I just want to hop straight into the main objectives. And, um, and so what we're going to be looking at in this paper is we're going to identify a natural and extensive class of dynamic liquidity provision strategies. And we're going to be expressing the earnings of liquidity providers for these simple classes of liquidity provision strategies that are actually quite flexible to, to encapsulate um, natural strategies that one might employ in practice. And treat the problem of optimizing over the simple classes of provision strategies. Uh, we'll, we'll cast this problem as an optimization problem and look at some qualitative insights in terms of what we might see liquidity providers be doing on chain. And I, I want to mention that this is a paper that's been it's been around for a while. And uh, and what we've done is we've actually changed a little bit of, of the of the modeling that we're doing here. In case some of you might have seen the previous version of of, of this paper. And so I, I can probably breeze through this uh, with this crowd, and especially given Andreas' talk earlier, I'll probably quickly go through some of the main features of Uniswap that we'll be looking at for this work. But um, first of all, we'll, we'll give an over overview of V2, uh, where we'll be, in, and then talk about the extra features of V3 that we use in the, in the liquidity provision strategies that we'll be studying. The, for V2, we, it's a decentralized exchange that trades between two tokens, token A and token B an automated market maker that has a functional invariant where the constant product of uh, the product of the reserves is remain constant uh, throughout trades and uh, notationally speaking we'll have uh, will denote the state of the contract in terms of the reserves we'll, we'll note that as a tuple xy and it has to respect the fact that the product all, all trades have to respect the fact that the product of these two reserves is constant and when, when traders interact with the con contract they're going to be sending amounts of token to the contract which is going to move the reserves along this constant product curve. And fees are skimmed and given to liquidity providers as part of the, uh, of the um, earnings that they make over a time horizon. So pictorially speaking, we've seen this picture before. But as we all know, traders are going to be moving points along this curve for a given fixed amount of liquidity. And along the way, fees are going to be accrued for liquidity providers, which is going to be part of the profit that we'll be studying in the strategies that we look at. Um, and, and importantly, the, the, the state of the contract for, for V2 can be expressed both in terms of the reserves that we have X and Y, but also in terms of the liquidity that's in the contract and the given price uh, that's held by the contract at that point of time. And uh, the two types of agents that interact with it, traders will be moving the price along the curve as we saw before. And liquidity providers, the agents that we focus on in this, in this talk, are going to be adding and removing liquidity. And, and in V2 contracts, there's no functionality in terms of deciding where liquidity goes. Simply, liquidity is added and taken away at moments of time. Uh, and this is done via mints and burns according to specific functional equations, which we don't really need to delve into the details of this too much. But uh, essentially, bundles of tokens are sent to the contract at a given price. And bundles can be burnt and taken away from the contract if a liquidity provider has a claim to them in the contract. Um, and I just have a couple of slides on, on V3 to lay the groundwork for the design space that we're looking at for, um, for what, rather, the, the action space available to liquidity providers in V3. And so the extension from V2 to V3 is that now liquidity providers can allocate their liquidity to be used at prices at specific intervals. So the contracts have specific buckets uh, for which liquidity providers can purchase liquidity, one way of thinking about it, and each single one of these buckets. And the, the consequences of doing so are, is that um, one, it, it could be the case that allocating liquidity to a bucket, to a concentrated bucket, requires less capital than doing so for a larger bucket. And fees are going to be accrued when prices remain in that bucket. But at the same time, there are certain risks uh, inherent with this as well, where if prices exit the bucket, then fees are no longer accrued. And other losses can be larger in this context if one doesn't necessarily pick the right bucket to be allocating liquidity to. Um, and so functionally speaking, uh, what, what uh, uh, trades look like within a specific bucket for V3 would look pictorially something like this, where if we look at the two points A and B, two different prices, we can consider this, the, the red curve as the reserve curve for the specific bucket between price A and price B. And it's an affine transformation of the blue curve that requires less capital to support the same trades at given price points. And 
And ultimately, the previous picture was at a local level for a specific bucket. You can glue these things together and get a global aggregate reserve curve for a given allocation of liquidity by multiple liquidity providers. And, and typically, it looks like this, where you will have a, uh, these are all possible prices on the left, and the heights of the, of the bar charts is how much liquidity by different providers is put in these specific buckets around price one. And we see that this has an aggregate effect around the unit price of flattening out this reserve curve and providing less liquid for trades. Um, but really, the, the key points that, uh, that I want to emphasize that we're going to be focusing on for this talk is that uh, now in V3, uh, LPs can, can mint positions in specific price intervals. This is the increased action space that we'll be looking at. And we also still have this notion of state where I, I wouldn't worry of this notation, but essentially traders change the price and liquidity providers can change the liquidity component of the state, and i.e. where they allocate liquidity and how much liquidity is allocated to different buckets. And so with that in hand, now I'm going to delve into the specific strategies that we look at in this work. Uh, but, um, but, now that, but, but before delving into the strategies, I, I want to talk about the, the environment around which these strategies are going to operate for liquidity providers. And as in, the, as in the papers that we've seen earlier, we are going to assume that the V3 contracts we're looking at are secondary markets. And hence, we're going to dif differentiate between the market price, external prices, say Binance, as I mentioned before, and the price that's offered, the spot price of the contract, um, PC. And, and we're going to, th these aren't going to, in general, be, be equal, but arbitrage will, will keep them close. Um, and we're going to be considering a finite time horizon of these pairs of prices as, as we go forward. And the, the first strategy that we look at, the simplest one, is what we call a static liquidity provision strategy, not yet adding the, uh, the dynamic nature that we focus on, where a, an, an LP is going to have an initial budget of token B, call it W, and we're going to allocate this budget proportionally to different buckets. And so a strategy is going to be identified with a vector in the simplex, uh, which uh, the ith component is how much is allocated to the ith bucket of the buckets in the contract. Uh, again, proportionally speaking, so uh, a certain amount of trades have to be done at the market price to get the correct bundle, to get liquidity at this, this given bucket. But nonetheless, the proportional amount of capital is going to be allocated to purchasing liquidity in that bucket. And over a specific time horizon, we can then express the fees that are going to be earned by this, uh, by this LP. And ultimately, at the end of this time horizon, what the LP is going to do is they're going to remove their liquidity from the contract at the final contract price and use the final market price to then put everything back in terms of token B so that we have a well-defined expression in terms of the earnings of the liquidity provider over this time horizon. And um, well, exactly what I just said. <laughs> so basically, that, uh, the, the, the earnings are going to be a combination of the fees and this final amount that, uh, that the liquidity provider obtains. And the, the interesting first observation from, actually from, from previous work, but that we use fundamentally in this, in this work, is that uh, if we have a fixed contract market price sequence, then um, th these components uh, are the a liquidity provider's earnings is actually independent of other liquidity providers. And moreover, it's actually a linear expression in terms of the, of the strategy that they've expressed in their initial capital. Um, so we have a well-defined, simple expression that we can manipulate in the context of uh, a fixed contract market price sequence. And, and this makes it very easy to extend this to a dynamic strategy space. So now in the, in the dynamic setting, the, the only difference that we've added, we still have this contract market price sequence, is that at any time step, the liquidity provider will allow them to trigger a reset. And by a reset, we're going to have a very specific action that they use at this reset, but now they're, they're going to withdraw their liquidity and again, move it all to whatever it's worth in terms of token B, and reuse this liquidity to mint a potentially new position. Um, and they don't necessarily have to use all of the capital that they have, but uh, they, they can do this at any moment of time, and, and, and they're, they're going to incur a cost for doing so, which is going to be proportional in the amount of uh, liquidity they use to put into the contract. Think about this in terms of potentially gas fees that can be paid for, for minting a new position, um, or and and this will be denoted by eta, and we'll, we'll we'll have capital lambda be what we call a dynamic liquidity provision strategy. But this this is still very general, hasn't really been, um, it, um, and it behaves like a static 
a liquidity provision strategy in between resets. And so we can use the exact same machinery from before in a very simple extension in this context. Um, and so we have one intermediate refinement before we reach the, the space of strategies that we actually look at. So bear with me a little bit. Where uh, we, what we call reset uh, strategies, we're going to be focusing on liquidity providers that keep track of some very simple information when making decisions with respect to resets. We're going to imagine that liquidity providers are keeping track of a, a reference bucket, um, so some index of a specific bucket, potentially the price at which a reset was triggered before. They're going to be looking at their current earnings and historical prices and as a function of this, making a decision of whether to reset liquidity and how, where to allocate it accordingly. Um, and so mathematically speaking, they'll have a reset condition as a function of the state. Uh, there'll be a reference bucket that they can update. After they trigger a reset, they can update a new reference bucket to be used as information for um, allocating liquidity. And, and a specific alloc allocation function that can make use of the given reference bucket of the given information at that time. Um, so within this family reset strategies, we finally reach the object of study of this, of this paper, which is what we call tau reset uh, strategies. So these are reset strategies where the trigger for a reset is a very simple condition. Namely, there's a, at any moment of time, the liquidity provider is going to have a reference bucket. Think about this as the price at the moment in which they made a reset. And if price deviates too much from this bucket, too much being measured in terms of if it reaches a bucket that's far from the reference bucket index by a value of tau, then the liquidity provider is going to trigger a reset and, and reallocate liquidity, but trigger a reset and then update the reference bucket to the current price at that moment of time. There'll be a picture shortly to explain this. But um, importantly speaking, this, is only, uh, this doesn't necessarily specify the allocation to be used at the moment of a trigger. It's flexible in that context. It's just simply saying when we trigger a reset of liquidity. And so pictorially speaking, we have, a, we have a picture here where the shaded buckets are where we can allocate liquidity at a moment of time. And um, well, the colored ones, apologies. And the shaded one is where the price might be. And we see over the course of a price sequence that if the, sh if the uh, shaded uh, bucket exits the colored buckets, then we've left this tau neighborhood of, of buckets and we trigger a reset to be centered again once more around the shaded bucket. And that's the high level um, functionality of triggers that we look at. And so now, given that we have this strategy, we can optimize over the earnings for, for this. And um, in order to do so, we, we cast everything from before in terms of a fixed contract market price sequence. But we can consider a distribution of contract market price sequence as a belief that a liquidity provider might have over how the market might evolve over time. And, um, and, and this is an, an, a modeling assumption, nonetheless, because in general, actually, if a liquidity provider is large enough, they will influence uh, the, the contract prices uh, because you can change the slippage effectively that you have in the contract. Um, but for small liquidity providers, it's reasonable to assume that uh, what they do isn't going to necessarily change the way the market is going to behave. Um, and so we can model their beliefs as being a liquidity independent distribution. And, and for this, it becomes very simple to, to optimize. We can simply optimize an expectation over these beliefs. And we're, again, we're optimizing the earnings that a liquidity provider might have over a time horizon. And we can look at risk aversion as well, tack on a concave utility function. And, and for fixed values of tau, which is, again, this, this trigger condition that we have, we can look at families of allocation functions, which is namely, how do I reallocate my liquidity at a moment of time, and optimize for this. And the, one of the main methodological advances of, of, of this work is that now we, we uh, can parametrize the allocation functions by a neural network. And we can exploit the recurrent structure of this to optimize for, for this recurrent neural network. So, so pictorially speaking, uh, the neural network approach that we're going to be looking at, at every time step is going to have this context C. And given this context in terms of how much wealth I have, the bucket that I'm at, et cetera, is going to run that context through a feed-forward neural network that is going to decide the allocation given this context. And this proceeds over, over time, and we have uh, trigger resets. And so we get this recurrence over here where my neural network is going to affect my wealth in subsequent rounds, which is then going to affect my context. And what's interesting about this is that this, um, once we take multiple samples and optimize, this is a recurrent with the same structure as a recurrent neural network. So we can use the techniques that are available to us to, to optimize recurrent neural networks. We can use stochastic gradient descent, backpropagation, 
and we can and we can optimize for this family of strategies. And so I'll end by giving some computational results. So we're going to look at some computational results on synthetic data, but that nonetheless is informed from some uh, from from data and practice. So. We're going to be looking at market. There's a market price component and a contract price component. And for market prices, uh, they'll be informed by uh, um, using a geometric Brown, Brown in motion and maximum likelihood estimates on existing token pairs. And the, the model that we use for how market prices and contract prices evolve, we've seen similar models actually in the previous days. But essentially, it, the, the, the pairs are going to evolve over rounds where at any given round, the market price is going to change according to the stochastic process that we've defined before. And within the round, there's going to be a certain amount of, un of uninformed, non-arbitrage trades. And these are going to be uh, done with uh, a, a, multi a magnitude, a, a multiplicative magnitude increase of, of price or decrease. And if at any moment of time there's a, 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 a discrepancy between contract and market prices, then arbitrage is going to put it back into place. So the main parameters for this is, are going to be the number of non-arbitrage trades per round, the magnitude of price changes from uninformed traders, and the trader fees are going to impact arbitrage. And so the strategies that we look at are uh, a, a static allocation as a baseline. And we look at two uh, um, dynamic allocations. One where the neural network makes use of the context to, to optimally allocate liquidity. And another one where there's the same proportional vector is, is used at every single reset of liquidity. So think about this as an intermediate uh, strategy. And so the, we first look at how price volatility might impact the, uh, the behavior of liquidity providers. And first of all, we see, and in these plots, the x-axis is the tau value. So you can think about this as affecting how often I might trigger resets. And for a fixed tau value, we can optimize. And so the yellow plots are the optimal context-aware um, strategy. Blue is the intermediate. And these dotted lines are the constant one. So um, we see, first of all, that the yellow plots, the neural network outperforms all of these. Um, we also see that with increased price volatility, and with uh, larger tau values, which mean smaller tau values, which mean more resets, the context prevails. And this is more apparent here. And going from the top to bottom, we see a larger separation. And we see that larger tau values are actually better for the blue uh, graph, which means less often resets. Um, we can also vary the non-arbitrage flow in our synthetic environments. Um, we have time dependence in terms of the non-arbitrage flow. And we see that uh, as we have more time dependent non-arbitrage flow, the context-aware neural network outperforms because it is able to keep track of the patterns in non-overcharge flow that might be in the underlying sequence. Um, and in the sake of time, I'll... The, the other thing that we see, too, is that um, as risk aversion increases, we see what we expect, namely that liquidity providers spread out their liquidity more across buckets. Um, and this larger spread, as expected, implies that you might have less variance in your earnings. Um, but you also have less earnings as you spread out your liquidity over multiple buckets. So we see a larger spread as this continues. Um, and then finally, as expected, with, uh, with increased reallocation costs, we might have larger values of tau, which means um, larger spreads, less resets, because it's expensive to trigger resets. And so we see this here, especially in the bottom, as these peaks shift to the right for, the, for these plots. But um, so just to conclude on uh, future directions, so this is a preliminary study only looking at Uniswap v3. So of course, the main directions are to look at constant other CFMM designs, other trading losses. Uh, not really here, we, we're implicitly looking at impermanent loss, but lever, of course, is a natural next direction. v4 was recently just announced. So with hooks, this is that, uh, there is now a rich amount of action spaces that can be increased. So definitely, the, the, the methodology here should extend to a certain amount of hooks as well. Um, of introducing uh, dependence on the distribution is also crucial in order to incorporate game theory. Everything is decision theoretic until now. And we would like to incorporate competition amongst liquidity providers. Um, and, and finally, the, I, I, these techniques allow us to, we could have an empirical study of rationality of liquidity providers. Maybe if there's a prior over beliefs that they might have, then we see the specific allocations that they've done. This could give us a, a posterior over their beliefs and help us potentially interpret aggregate liquidity distributions. Um, thank you. Here's a QR code for our uh, main paper. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Any questions for Francisco? Yes, Andrea. Uh, 
just a clarification. You said that I can analyze my own strategy independently on the distribution of liquidity. Mm -hmm. uh, this I was a bit, so um, a bit, a bit confused because my prior, but maybe it's wrong, is that, uh, uh, as I says, um, uh, if I am optimizing my strategies, someone else is uh, so. There is a, there is a lever. There are fees collected from noise traders. In the end of the day, if I'm doing a better strategy to collect more of these uh, fees from noise traders, someone else uh, in, who's also providing liquidity might be earning less. Um, but you seem to be arguing differently, so I wanted to. Clarify. Yeah, th th no, that's a really good question, and that's a, one of the core modeling assumptions. This this falls from the the fact that we're looking at a price sequence being independent of my actions. And so if you think about the price sequence, um, for example, imagine that a price movement is going to be happening. If I put an insane amount of liquidity in that price sequence, of course I'm gonna potentially affect the volume of the trade that needs to support that price change. But I still, the volume increases and I get a larger proportional amount of fees. And so it actually, it balances out uh, quite, quite nicely. But nonetheless, it comes from this strong assumption that my actions won't affect the, the, the price sequence or the distribution, which is, akin to being so small that I'm not affecting the actions that others do. But but that's the most immediate next direction in terms of incorporating game theory and, depend, and competition. Maybe just to uh, follow up on that, uh, does that mean then if you only have a price movement and follow that, that you only consider uh, arbitrage trades and not noise trades? Uh, we're, we're considering both uh, of these trades. So on an arbitrage trade, you actually you do end up losing, um, e even though there's still this independence in terms of uh, the, the price trade. But um, both both of these trades we're considering as changing the the, the price in the, in the stochastic price model that we have. Mm, and the, and your claim that uh, my fees do not depend on other liquidity providers also holds. It also holds exactly. Um, and actually, before signing off, shameless plug, I'm also on the job market for faculty positions, so please feel free to reach out if, um, if there's anything available. We'll be glad to talk about this or other job market work, which is quite different from this, on allocating medical resources in the pandemic in Mexico. Thank you.